So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Esther Geva, and I'm a professor in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Suriel uh, for, uh, for this talk today. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he is a professor of uh, clinical and educational psychology at Bar Ilan University in Israel. And he's a visitor of our department this year. He's a visiting professor in our department. Uh, and I also should point out that this talk is co-sponsored by APHD, i.e. Applied Psychology and Human Development, which is the name of the department, and the OEZ Scholar in Residence Program. Uh, you all know the title of his presentation, but I'll read it anyway, because I understand we're being recorded. Uh, Learning Potential, Myth or Reality? The Impact of Quality Mediation, the Family and Among Peers. So I would like to say that anybody who uh, knows anything about dynamic assessment learning potential for sure has heard uh, David Suriel's name. Uh, definitely I've heard about it a long time ago. Um, he, and what I found out just about an hour ago was that uh, Professor Suriel in the 70s, when he was, an M he was an MA student and he was actually Ruben Forstin's uh, TA. I just learned that. Oh, interesting. Um, so David went to Vanderbilt University where he got his uh, PhD in clinical psychology and um, his areas of interest, as I'm sure that many of you know, otherwise he wouldn't be here, is uh, dynamic assessment of learning potential, cognitive and education programs, instrumental enrichment, de uh, development, that I didn't know, development of spatial ability and gender differences in spatial abilities. That one I didn't know that you're doing. Um, <laughs> Mother-child mediated learning experience, uh, peer and sibling mediation as they relate to cognitive modifi modifiability, ego identity processes in adolescence is another area. Um, uh, uh, Professor Triel was in the past also the president of the International Association of Cognitive and Edu uh, Education Psychology. He was the editor in chief of the Journal of Cognitive Education and Psychology. Uh, he has many, many publications, in including uh, five books and, of course, many journal articles. He published uh, 11 tests that are rela related to dynamic assessment, and I'll get to name, name them now. Uh, it's done. Uh, well, well, how much was it? And, it? More than 185 international workshops in various, in, all, in various places in the world. And he has supervised uh, at least 80 MA PhD students and so on and so forth. So it uh, really has a very illustrious career, career. And we are lucky that you're able to talk to us today. So. Okay, um, I would like first, we are talking about learning potential. Um, I would like to focus first on these two words before I will continue. This is like an introduction to, did someone so learning itself? Learning is a process that we are inferring from what we see, from what is the outcome. But what is learning? What is exactly learning? I'm sure many of you are, you ask yourself this kind of question. Um, maybe I should start with a, with a, a short uh, event that happened to me when I volunteered many years ago to a, a classroom of one of my daughters. And they ask uh, each week a volunteer, parent volunteer to teach something they were 12 years old uh, girls, so I asked them a short question. Suppose you, you throw a little stone to the sea. It weighs only 50 grams. What happens to the stone? Well, the stone will sink down immediately. So then I asked them, can you imagine a big ship, tanker, that weighs 10,000 kilograms? How comes it is floating on the water and a little stone is sinking down? So they began to give me all kinds of answers. One of the girls, for example, told me, teacher, teacher, there is under the ship, there is a big wheel that is turning all the time and lifting up the ship. She saw too many Huckleberry Finn movies, I guess. 
Another girl told me that as long as the ship is moving, then it's floating. And she was projecting something, um, th some experiences from the swimming pool into the situation. Uh, the answer is the, the buoyancy principle. It turned out that they learned this concept just one week ago. They learned it, so there is learning. But did she really learn it? If she cannot take what she learned to another situation, or what, how we call it a transfer, how can we call it a learning? What is then a learning? Sometimes you see a child that learns, but he really doesn't learn. And sometimes you see children that it seems that they don't know, but they really know it. So the question of learning is still a big question that we have to ask. How much more when we talk about potential? How do we measure potential? Potential is something in the future. So how do you measure something that is potential? This is one of the problems that we have when we are talking about learning potential. So I looked in the literature about the word learning potential and there are so many, maybe more than 4 million entries that talk about the myth of learning potential. So many see that as a myth. They don't believe that there is a potential. It's just a myth. And one of the famous sentences or phrases is, did you know that you only use 10% of your brain? This statistic is attributed to Albert Einstein and sometimes to William James. Neither, of course, said anything of that sort. The you only use 10% of your brain myth reflects a common feeling that we fall short of our intellectual potential. Removal of up to, well, that's a very old study by Lashley. If you are familiar with theories of learning, and Lashley was one of the first ones, so he's, he found that removal of fit, uh, up to 58% of cerebral co cortex did not affect certain types of learning. And I think this started the idea that maybe we are not using the best of our potential. So, but there is a big debate about it. It's not the, 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 this, this problem is not yet settled. Uh, if you are familiar with the book of Hernstein and Murray in 1994, there was a big debate whether what is the potential of individuals, what is the IQ, how IQ is, a, is related to race, how much is it genetically related and how much environmentally related and so on and so on. This is a lecture by itself, I will not go into it. Most people are fed a steady diet of potential from the moment they were, are born. Parents, teachers, coaches all contribute to the problem by overrating potential as a certain predictor of future performance. Now, I I'm saying things now that I will refute later. Potential affords no surety of outcome. It merely offers hope. That's what some people say. While hope can clearly serve as an inspiration, it can also quite easily become a delusion. That's what people say. Um, what is the role of non-intellective factors and learning potential? Many researchers argue that people are not special because of their potential. They are special because of their dog pursuit of their potential. And they are even more special when they achieve their potential. The keys to converting potential into attainment relate to a variety of non-intellective non factors, such as attachment, intrinsic motivation, curiosity, commitment, emotional intelligence, psychological resilience, and so on and so on. My view, and this is what I figured out, tried to figure out, that we all agree that there is some innate potential. Everyone has an innate potential. This is by nature, right? this definition of human being. And as a rule, 
It is higher than actual performance. Uh, if you are familiar with Vygotsky and Feuerstein's approaches, um, they, and, and many, many others, they say that what, when we perform, it is, there is the actual level of performance, and of course, the potential level is not there. So how can we reach the potential? The innate potential is affected by per family, peers, school, and culture impact. And, the, and this is related to, and immediately I will come to it, to the quality of mediated learning interactions, which is considered uh, by many as the proximal factor for achieving potential. And those factors are affecting the cognitive abilities and emotional functioning. And I include the emotional domain together with the cognitive domain because they are unseparated. It is only methodologically, we, we separate between these two domains only methodologically, but actually you cannot really separate the emotional from the cognitive. They both together from the first day of life. So we are talking about outcome cognitive performance, but we should bear in mind that it is related also to non-intellective factors. Uh, here I would like to present a transactional model of cognitive, emotional, motivational, family, peers, and culture factors, and they are interrelated. Um, by the way, what do you think are the arrows here are depicted correctly? Uh, can you, this is related to your special orientation skills. Uh, if the uh, um, if the red um, wheel is moving clockwise to the right, yes? So how the others are moving? So this is by, by it's just an interesting question. Um, it could be an interesting question to see if the, to figure out what will be the movement of the other one. Anyhow, they are interrelated. You see, emotional motivational factors could move the cognitive factors. The mo cognitive factors could move the family and peers and culture factors. And sometimes they are contradicting. They sh I mean, if they move all the same direction, then it's fine. But sometimes they might move in, in, a, in a different direction. And when, it, when they move in a different direction, then there could be some break of the system. The system could break in some way or another. Um, in my studies during the last 35 years, I was looking on mediated learning experiences, which immediately I'll explain what they are and how they are related to cognitive modifiability. I prefer to use the concept cognitive modifiability rather than learning potential. Uh, because the word learning potential has many, many, it, it creates resistance uh, for many because they, they don't go deeply into understanding what is the meaning of that. So I prefer operationally to use the word cognitive modifiability. How do you change as a result of intervention? And the level of the change that you show as a result is indicative of what can you do in the future, provided that you will get the ingredients to actualize your abilities. So I did studies on dynamic assessment, which is an approach where we are looking not on the manifested performance of the individual, but we are looking how individual learn and change, and then we can take those change criteria to predict what will happen in the future, provided with, we, will, uh, uh, we will give the individual opportunities to learn, and we'll teach that individual to actualize his abilities. I did studies on cognitive educational programs, and how they are effective in changing individuals. I did studies on peers and siblings 
mediate the learning experience within the family and outside the family in the school system and what is the power of peers and siblings in creating cognitive modifiability. I look, I uh, also did many studies on parent-child mediated learning experience. We videotaped mother-child interactions, father-child interactions, grandmothers' interactions with their grandchildren in order to see the power of mediation and how does it affect the cognitive as well as the emotional outcomes of the, the quality of the mediation within the family. And of course we did some cross-generational um, cultural transmission, how it is transmitted from one generation to another. You can ask yourself the question, if you saw your children mediating one to another, many times you see a replica of your own behavior. And you ask yourself, how come they do that? I never told them to do that. And still, when they teach each other or guide each other, you can see that they are a reflection of what you are doing with them. So how this mediation goes from one generation to another? This is a topic that is not yet uh, explored uh, a lot. Um, so, when we talk about mediated learning experience interactions, and immediately I'll explain what it is in the family system as affecting cognitive modifiability, we have to see what are the other factors that contribute to that, starting from peers, cultural dimensions. Um, it depends on what culture you live in. Some cultures, they do not emphasize the importance of learning or the importance of mediation. Uh, I have done several uh, cross-cultural studies where I showed uh, that in some cultures mediation is very low and so it goes from one generation to another. The children are not, when they grow up, they do not mediate to their children and it, it just goes from one, the, 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 the problem goes from one generation to another. Um, it affects emotional personality factors such as psychological resilience of individuals, their academic achievements, of course, which this is the focus for many researchers, problem-solving skills that are not necessarily academic. Um, so all these factors are uh, affecting the cognitive modifiability of the individual. So what is cognitive modifiability? One of the definitions that was given by Feuerstein is the, uh, it is defined as individual's propensity to learn from new experiences and learning opportunities and to change their own cognitive structures. And those changes are uh, beyond barriers of age which means you can change yourself even when you are old, beyond severity of the situation, if you are born with some difficulty, and beyond genetics, beyond the etiology, the genetic etiology of the individual. Um, and we have seen many, many situ uh, examples of people who change beyond all kinds of difficult barriers, provided that they were given appropriate intervention to change their abilities. And I hope that I will convince you in, in, in the coming uh, presentation. So what is mediated learning experience? MLE is an interactional process in which parents, substitute adults, or peers interpose themselves between a set of stimuli and the learner and modify the stimuli for the developing child. It is done in many ways from the age of zero. When the mother or father take their baby in their hands and they are beginning to talk with them and communicate with them non-verbally and verbally, they are mediating to them. There is, for example, the turn-taking behavior. When you are doing to the baby, ah, uh, 
and then you wait until the infant responds. So there is this very important turn-taking behavior. Some parents don't know how to do it. And so when the infant starts to talk, they block his talking. So this is a very fundamental, primitive type of interaction that starts from a very early age, but it is creating the basis of turn-taking in later ages. So this is just an example of, of mediation. Mediation does not have to be, you know, with lofty words and so on. It could be something very, very simple that you have to do with a child. And those figures are uh, the major figures that talked about the concept of mediation. One of them is Lev Vygotsky, and the other one is, is Feuerstein. Lev Vygotsky passed away at the age of 37. He was very young, but he created such a revolution in psychology uh, in, in such short years that he lived. Feuerstein is 92 years old, and God will give him more years, and very active and alive and doing things and so on and so on. Um, we are talking about learning potential. In, in one of my studies, I looked into a, four groups of children. One of them are gifted children. This is the group that is um, in the G. You can see this is the, the group there. And the other one are, um, are they're, not gift, they're not defined as gifted, but they are outstanding children, or children with outstanding Great, so we divided them into outstanding high, outstanding low, and then typically developing children. So those groups are given um, according to uh, psychometric tests that are done in Israel for a huge number of children in grades uh, grade two and three. And the reason they do this uh, test is, all, is in order to give them enrichment programs. But only the gifted are entitled to get these enrichment programs. So what I did, I included, I tested all those children. I took into account a static test, but I also inserted dynamic test and some motivational and emotional, emotional intelligence type of tests. And then we did discriminant function analysis to see how many children fall in each category based on their original um, division and based on the other factors that we introduced. And we found that when we looked into uh, the division according to the discriminant function, we could enter um, more children into the rubric of gifted children. Um, there are many gift, and that's my belief also, that there are many gifted children that are not diagnosed as gifted in spite of the fact um, that actually when they go to, you know, they don't live in a, in a psychometric test, they live in their life, you know, they, they live in a school system, they live in, in other situations, and they are very, very successful, and they are performing very well, because they have those kind of features and characteristics that are not necessarily related to the psychometric test. So if you see the difference in the first two groups, the G and the OH, the outstanding high, they are more gifted uh, according to this system than according to the conventional system. And of course, the OL and T are um, they're less. So what, the, what it means is that we have to be very careful when we are talking about learning potential or talking about uh, giftedness, which is somehow related to the learning potential. Uh, there are many individuals who are very, very smart and very intelligent, 
but when they go later on, you know, they go, they are not very successful in the, in the university, in college, or when they go to life situations, they are not very successful, not necessarily related to their IQ, because there are other factors that are relevant to academic success or success in life. So we have to take it into account as well. The main model of the mediated learning experience is this model of stimulus impinging on the organism and then impinging on the R, which is the response. This is a, a modified or qualified model of the SR, of the behavioristic approach, or maybe Piaget's approach that looked on the S OR, or because Piaget was looking on what's going on in the organism as a result, and as a result, how does it express itself in the response of the, he's, he's way beyond the behavioristic approach. And Feuerstein included the H, which is the human being that is in between the world of stimuli and the organism, and the mediator or is mediating the world to the organism. There is an importance for having a mediator in the formative years of every individual. And those, uh, it is done in many, many ways by framing the environment, by focusing the individual on some aspect of the environment that are more important than others, by alerting the individual to some aspect in the environment that is more important than others by rewarding the individual for doing well, by interpreting the environment to the individual, interpreting his own success. Many individuals are very successful, but they do not have feelings of success because nobody interpreted to them that they are successful. And there are some cultures that are very laconic. They do not interact with children. They do not really convey to the child how much you are successful. And so children are growing up without knowing that they are so successful, they don't have mediation. Now the H <coughs> stands here also in between the O and the R, and it means that the role of the mediator is also to ex explain or mediate to the child how to express his own response. Many individuals learn, but they don't know how to express what they learn. So they have, there is a role for the mediator also in mediating your own thoughts that you developed already. How are you going to express them? This is also part of the mediation. Um, Feuerstein suggested 12 criteria of mediation. I'm not going to repeat or to, to explain all of them, but maybe the first five because I work with them so far so much and they are really the major ones. One is, and I will translate it into a friendly, friendly concepts, focusing. Focusing is very simple, it's very universal. When, let's say, the mother is focusing the child on some aspect of the environment. Focusing is very important. When a mother shows to the child a flower and says, look at the flower, this is focusing. It is related also to reciprocity, as you can see, intentionality and reciprocity. So you focus the child in a different way after you get some reciprocity from the child. So you, 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 you change your focusing. You do not continue to focus if the child is already focused. You, you, you are reciprocating. So focusing is very important. And it's, by the way, it's universal everywhere. In all cultures, there is focusing when parents are teaching their children. The second one is meaning. So it's not enough to just focus the child, you have to give it some meaning. So when you label it, when you give it significance, when you give it importance. So if the mother shows to the child the flower and she says, look what a nice flower. Or she can say, look, 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 what a nice, beautiful flower. And she's excited about it. 
Now, of course, the child is activated. The child is fascinated. So, mediation is how to give meaning. By the way, this is a nonverbal way of giving meaning. Of course, you can give meaning by, by talking about that. But if, you're, if you don't give meaning, there is no learning. Because who cares? How many teachers give meaning when they teach math? How much they are excited when they teach math or science? Or when they teach literature and they're excited about it? If you remember one of your, teacher, one of your teachers from the past, he would be one that made an impact on you because he was excited about what he was teaching. If he was not excited, it, it doesn't matter. It was boring. I remember some of my teachers in the university bringing their old yellow pages and just reading it from the pages. And they do it every year the same. This was the most boring, and I don't remember anything from that, from that course. Those that you remember that are those that are giving meaning. Another aspect is transcending. Transcending means, and this is the third one that makes it makes an, an interaction to be called universal if they are the three together. When you go beyond the information and give a principle, a rule that is related to the interaction. So if the mother says, and this flower grows in the autumn. So whenever we see this flower grows, we know the autumn is coming. So you give a principle. You go beyond the information. I mean, it's not, it's not concrete. It's not the here and now. It's something beyond. Whenever you transcend the information and you give some rule, then it is more effective. As a matter of fact, this is the essence of the mediation. I did about 15 studies on mother-child interactions. And transcendence was the very rare. Most of the times, parents are not transcending the information. They, they are involved in interactions. But the quality of transcending, giving rules, principles, and so on, does not exist a lot. It's just very few. Nevertheless, when we try to predict achievements, school achievements in, in the future, based on mother-child interactions at home. This one came as the most powerful in the prediction. Now, if you know a little bit statistics, because this element, this principle is so low, is so rare, there is the limiting of the range of the score. Whenever the range of the score is limited, it's very difficult to come in the regression analysis as a predictor because it's limited in terms of the, the scale. The scale is very small. Nevertheless, it was powerful in doing the prediction, which means, <clears throat> I have an analogy for that, it's, um, you know, the Persians are doing very good rice. And they put in the rice something that gives it a good uh, smell and taste. It is something very, it, it, it's a spice. Yeah. What? what? Yeah. That's it. That's the name. They put one small and it gives ah, aroma to the whole thing. And this is transcendence. This is the one that gives aroma to the whole interaction process. This is the quality. Another one is feeling those competence. When you are interacting with children, you have to give feelings of competence, which means you have to organize the, the environment so that the child will have feelings of competence. You have to reward the child for doing it. You have to interpret to the child his own competence. All of, this is, all of those are included under the same rubric of feelings of competence. We found, for example, that Ethiopian mothers were not mediating feelings of competence at all. At all. They are, they are black. We did studies with native Indians in British Columbia. And we found that in the interaction, 
the child is doing something good and they are just look with stoic face on what the child is doing and not saying anything to the child. This is something cultural. They were not reacting. Another one is self-regulation. How you regulate the child's behavior? If it's too impulsive, how do you regulate it to be more systematic? Or if the child is too slow, how you interact with the child to make it faster? So it depends on the task. But you have to learn how to do that. Later on, later on, those, those factors are done also in the school. But in the school, not, man, not very many teachers are mediating well. They can be good teachers, excellent teachers, but not good mediators. How come? They are very good as long as the lesson is okay. There is nothing uh, wrong. But when there is a difficulty, they don't know how to deal with the difficulty. They don't know how to mediate to overcome the difficulty. So they explain again and again and again, and the child still doesn't understand. The child is stupid. He has no learning potential. He does not learn. So, in order to be a good mediator, your finger should be pointed to you. What should I do to overcome it and not to the child? You don't know. So, what can I do for you? I explained it so, so many times, you don't understand. So, I didn't come yet to the studies. <laughs> Immediately I'll come. I'm going to go over very fast on the questions that we asked. And I'm not going to give you answers for all of them because I need maybe two semesters to go over all the, these issues. But I will just show you what were the questions that we talked about. The first one, what is the relative effects of distal and proximal factors on cognitive modifiability? Uh, distal factors are factors such as socioeconomic status, poverty level, um, genetic factors, um, they are not necessarily related to success in school. They, are, they may be related in a, in, a, in a peripheral way. The proximal factor is considered to be, according to the theory, the mediated learning experience, which is the quality of mediation that is given at home or in school or in other situations. So, what is the weight of each, the mediation at home versus other factors in affecting the cognitive modifiability of the child, or if you want to say, the academic achievements of the child? What are the most efficient MLE strategies for intellectual development? I mentioned to you five, there are several more. Um, so which of them is the strongest predictor? Do Emily processes transmitted from parents to child? And is it done automatically or there is something to be done so that it will be transferred? And if so, how? How are we going to do that? Don't we want our children to, do good to be good mediators? First of all, good mediators to themselves. For example, when I learn, sometimes I need mediation myself, so I have to be not shy to go and ask for mediation. But most of the time, I mediate to myself. When I have a problem, I ask myself, how do I go about to solve this problem? And I have my own strategies of dealing and finding the solution. But we have to teach children how to mediate to themselves. So how do we do that? We want children to be autonomously doing this kind of mediation. What are the effects of motivational, emotional, and personality factors on Emily processes? If a mother is rejecting the child, how can she mediate? If there is no attachment, Bolby, how can she mediate? If it's very difficult to mediate when there, the climate, the, the emotional climate is, is negative. You cannot mediate. And if you try to mediate, it will just create antibodies for mediation. By the way, we know many children are developing antibodies for mediation. 
Did you see children with uh, special education children who are overworked? Like they come back from school, they have one teacher, one private teacher after another, and they work with them very, very hard. So they develop antibodies for mediation. They don't want to listen. The minute they smell mediation, they reject it. I remember one of my daughters, when she had a problem in math and she came to me, can you help me to solve this problem? And I, okay, I took the problem and said, okay, let's see. Let's really say, Daddy, don't start with it. Just, just, just give me the answer. Or go, go ahead and, and give me how to solve it. Don't start with this. So the antibodies for mediation are many times developed by children of teachers and psychologists or special education children. <laughs> If we can teach young children how to mediate efficiently, what then is the effect on the cognitive modifiability of the mediator and the learner? Can we teach very young children to, to be good mediator? Can we take the theory and teach it to very young children and make them good mediators? You know that if you are a good mediator, you are also a good learner. In order to be a good learner, first of all, try to be a good mediator. Then you understand how to be a good learner. Are Emily processes different among mothers and fathers? This is fascinating because many times there is a dispute. Who is a better mediator, the father or the mother? And we found a, a very big, a very nice correlation between the two, which means that if you are born to a family where the father or the mother is a good mediator, so you get the other parent also as a good mediator, and vice versa. So if you are born with a bad, one parent is bad mediator, so you are penalized twice. It's a, it's a double penalty. Are Emily processes different among parents of low and high socioeconomic status? It's a, one of the questions we asked several times. We have definite answers for that. Does parents' mediation affect motivational, emotional, and personal factors in addition to their effects on cognitive modifiability? Does it affect other factors, not just the cognitive realm, but also other factors as well? Three more questions. Does siblings' mediation related to family size? There is a theory that says that if the, the size of the family is big, the average IQ of the family, of the children in the family is low. Why? Because the biggest the family, the less time is given to each child, so the IQ is low. And there are studies that show that in big families, they have low, the IQ is low. Is it? we found just the opposite when we talk about cognitive modifiability. Uh, because we looked at how, peer, how siblings are teaching each other. What is the relative weight of the quality of parents' mediation to the amount of time spent with a child? This is a question of quality against quantity. Good news for working mothers, it's the quality that counts. I don't see well from here. Okay, thanks. So, how cognitive modifiability related to academic achievements? And this is, of course, a question that is very... So, we did many of our studies using the observation of mediation interaction. This is a measure developed by Penina Klein, who is my colleague at bar -Ilan University. And we used dynamic assessment tests like that. This is the CATM that I developed for young children. So this is an analogy. You have to find what's the solution. Some of the problems here are very difficult even for adults. It is used all over the world. For example, if you look on the problem number 13, I'm sure it will not pop into your mind. You need to think very hard to solve it. And five years old children, they solve it after mediation most of the children can solve these kind of problems. It's very difficult. Um, or the Ray 
Um, complex figure test, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, and we are using it in a dynamic way, which means we are teaching and then we see the, the copy and memory before and after the teaching process. This is another test that I developed that is related to um, hypothetical thinking. This is the CMB. It's another test that I developed, cognitive modifiability but battery. This is also an analogy, but it's much, much more difficult and we use it with gifted children. This is more pictorial analogies. So, um, the king, the castle, this is what child told me, the castle belongs to the king and the women belongs to the men. <laughs> well, then what should I do? I should ask, is the castle belongs to the king in the same way that the women belong to the men? Is it in the same way, like kind of property? Or, yeah, of course she belongs. I belong to my wife. My wife belongs to me. We use the word belong, but what is the meaning of belong? There are connotations. So, of course, the answer is just the house, uh, in, because that's, that's the way. Um, and uh, this is construction analogies. The child has to build up an analogy, not just to give the answer, but to construct an analogy. So you have to find two and the other two, okay? You have to find a pair and then another pair. So you have any idea what pairs to put together? Not easy. Five years old. Okay, give you a hint. You weigh the child with that kind of scale and you weigh the oranges with that type of scale. And there are some rival, rival um, solutions for that. You start with something, but then you cannot continue with that. So it shows how the child thinks analogically, and we know that analogy is a very um, basic component in human thinking. So, parent-child interactions. In one of the studies, <clears throat> we've looked into we gave a pretest, which is the CITM pre. You see it in the beginning, and then we gave. There was teaching, and there was CITM post. Post means after teaching, so we have a different score. After teaching, children are doing much better. That's cliche. But then we looked on the gain score, which is we considered it the cognitive. Modifiability. If I would do this test today, I would do it a different way because gain score is not a good one. Everyone knows gain, just simple gain is not good, but many years ago we did a gain score. But even though we found very interesting, then very interesting result. Then we measured the IQ of the child using the raven, the colored raven, and we looked into the quality of mediation within mother-child interaction. So we wanted to know what predicts the cognitive score. The mother-child interactions or the IQs, the IQ of the child. So when we looked on the pre, it's the raven. It's IQ and IQ. It's like this is a cognitive score and this is a cognitive score. So they are related. The mediation was not related. When we looked on the post, the post is composed of what the child brings into the situation plus the element of mediation given by the examiner. It is, it's a, a score that reflects two elements. One is the basic cognitive ability and one what is added by mediation given to the child during the dynamic assessment. So this was um, predicted by the two elements, the raven and the mediation of the mother. But when we looked only on cognitive modifiability, which means it's a pure gain, the only one that predicted is the mediation of the mother. Which means, if the mother is a good mediator, shows high qualitative level of mediation, by the way, we are trying to quantify the quality. Okay, the quality of mediation, we, 
we developed a way of quantifying the quality of the mediation. So this is the, the MLE total. It predicted the gain of the child. So children who know how to gain from learning are those who have mothers who are good mediators. They prepare them to be good learners in the future. Good mediation at home prepares the child to be a good learner outside of the home situation. This was the first study that we used with mother-child interactions. Then we did a series of studies using structural equation modeling, and each time we changed the variables. The basic model, this is the basic model, we have socioeconomic status and raven mother. This is the intelligence of the mother. Because we ask, does the intelligence of the mother can predict the, her mediation? In order to be a good mediator, do you, do you have to be intelligent or not? Does it require intelligence to be a good mediator? That was the question. And then how this affects the CATM prayer, which is a test of analogies before teaching, and the raven of the child, and then after teaching. And the results showed very clearly that socioeconomic status and mother's intelligence do not predict the CATM post, the one at the end, which reflects the modifiability of the child what the child does after the teaching phase. However, the socioeconomic status, as you can see here, predicts significantly the mediation, or most of them. That means that the higher the socioeconomic level, the higher is the level of mediation of the mother. By the way, we don't tell the mother what to do, we just videotape what she's doing, and then we analyze it later frame by frame. Every five seconds we stop it and then we record what happens in those five seconds. And of course there is a correlation between two observers showing us that there is agreement about what you see in front of your eyes. So, Raven of the Mother did not predict the mediation itself. That means that in order to be a good mediator, you don't have to necessarily to have good intelligence. And that's good news. Because very simple mothers could be wonderful mediators, and on the opposite, very sophisticated mothers can be rotten mediators. Really, they don't know how to mediate. They are very clever, very educated, I mean, not educate, educated, yes, they are intelligent, but they are not good mediators. There is not necessarily a relation, rela it's a zero relationship. And then we found that from the mediation criteria, one predicted CATM pre and one predicted CATM post. It is interesting to emphasize, to emphasize here that the one that predicted the CATM post was mediation for transcendence, giving rules, giving principles. That was found as the most powerful one in predicting the cognitive modifiability of the child represented by the CAT post. As you can see here, see raving of the child, this is the IQ of the child, is standing here in glorious isolation. It is not predicted by none of the variables and is not predicting any variable. It's just a score non-related score. That was published in 1990. Then we found repetition of the, the same thing with a different sample of children, different age, different set of tests, and different sets of variables. But the idea is that the proximal factors, which is mediation, predicts cognitive modifiability, and the distal factors such as mother's acceptance, rejection, or child's personality, they do not affect the cognitive modifiability directly. They affect the mediation, yes, but they do not affect 
the end result. The end result, as you can see here, and I cannot go very, very into detail into that. The end result, CIT and post, okay, CIT and post is reflecting cognitive modifiability, was predicted by two factors. Medi the qualitative quality of mediation, transcendence, again, and regulation of behavior. By the way, regulation of behavior is related very much to the task that we used. The CITM requires a lot of regulation of behavior. So children coming from homes where regulation of behavior is given, a high dose of regulation of behavior is given, and a high dose of mediation for transcendence is given, they internalize it, it becomes part of them, so when they go to other contexts, to other situations, and they are given mediation, they are ready to accept it, because they have, they have the tools to accept the mediation. Many children don't have the tools to accept the mediation. They cannot accept, you give the mediation, but they don't accept it, they don't know how to use it. Which reminds me about a very well-known joke about the guy who tried to smuggle two sacks of coffee beans to Israel in the beginning, the beginning years. He was caught by the customs. And they, they asked him, what's in here? He said, this is food for birds. Food for birds? Can you open the sacks? So he opened the sacks and they found, wow, Colombian coffee beans. How come this is food for birds? So he said, listen, listen. I give it to the birds. If they want to eat, they eat. If they don't want to eat, they don't eat. What can I do? But this is food for birds. So, the same thing. How is it related to mediation? You give mediation, but the child does not want to eat. He doesn't know how to eat the mediation given. He doesn't know how to absorb it. So you have to prepare to mediate to the child to accept the mediation. It's mediation for acceptance of mediation. Many times I work with children, and after a while they are successful, and I say, wow, you know to do it so well. Who taught you to do that? My daddy. <clears throat> I said, oh, come on, I was working hard. I was spreading, sweating blood to teach you, and you are saying, my daddy, come on. So I have to teach him. Okay, here is another study using, um, with many, 90 families, a variety of number of children in the family, starting from 3 to 12. How does it affect the Emily strategies in the, in the family of the siblings? Not mother, child, siblings. And then we looked into religious orientation of the family and how does it affect home support and how all of those are affecting, how home support affects Emily and how does it affect of the modifiability. And we found fascinating result. Number of children in the family is a positive factor because the more children in the family, the mediation within among siblings is higher, is better, is qualitative. And the reason is very simple, because they are relegated responsibilities, because the parents cannot do it all together, so they're relegated to their children and they become very good mediators. You can see in very big families how the older siblings are taking care of, them, of the youngest. It's fascinating to see. And the good news is that it affects eventually cognitive modifiability. Higher level of, of uh, Emily. I will not go uh, uh, to talk about the other factors. We did uh, many studies on parent-child mediation in children with special needs. So this is a study with ADHD children. And again, we looked on severity of the ADHD level, mother's knowledge about what is ADHD. Many, many mothers do not know what is ADHD. They don't understand it. They just see that the child is an evil child, a bad child doing all these problems all the time. Mother's education level, mother's stress level. How all of these are affecting mediation and how mediation affects the cognitive modifiability. And again, what we found, that the quality of mediation affects directly the cognitive modifiability of the child, you can see. And among them, transcendence, again, is the highest. And we can see 
one study after another, one study after another, mediation for transcendence is the strongest predictor, even though, even though it was given in a minor way. It's difficult to give transcendence because when you are interacting with a child, it's very difficult to, to learn from something from it and to give a rule and principle and so on and so on. But nevertheless, it turned to be the strongest one. It's very interesting here that mother's education level here goes directly to predict cognitive modifiability and the severity of ADHD level goes directly to explain cognitive modifiability against the theory of Feuerstein. Against the theory. The reason is <clears throat> that the mothers were not given here any program how to mediate. We just looked into their normal, typical mediation when she is not taught. It would be very interesting to see, and I think this is the next step of research, where we take a group of mothers and teach them how to mediate in a program that takes, uh, let's say, 20 to 30 uh, sessions. Then I would think that the effect of mediation would be so strong that it will eradicate the effect of the distal factors. But in this case, the mothers were just, the, this, those factors are so strong that you cannot resist them. That Of course, you give good mediation, but still, it is so powerful, the severity of the ADH level, that it affects cognitive modifiability negatively. Of course, you can see the minus in, in the number. It affects it in a, in a, in a negative way. Here is another study in which we looked into, this is with learning disabled children, and we looked on two factors, psychological resilience and cognitive modifiability, and there is a relationship between cognitive modifiability and resilience. The higher the cognitive modifiability of the child, the, the higher is the psychological resilience. It seems that the child can rely on, on the mediation given, and, and, it, and his cognitive modifiability helps him to deal with adverse situations and to become more, more resilient. So again, we see, I don't want to go into all the details, just to give you the major things, that mediation is, and you see here, meaning, transcendence, competence, regulation of behavior, they explain the cognitive modifiability, you see point 41 here, and they explain the psychological resilience as well. Um, home environment um, affects the mediation and directly affects the psychological resilience. And so and so on, I will not go into all the lines, but to show you a study after study after study showing the same thing. Um, canonical correlation between psychological resilience and mediation in the family is 0.74, which is very high in social sciences, considered to be high. The highest the mediation within the family, the highest is the psychological re resilience of the child. So this means that mediation prepares the child not only to be cognitively modifiable, but also to develop a, a kind of emotional, emotional uh, uh, Factor that that is is uh, that, that, so that the child can stand up in in front of adverse situation. He's resilient. Um, this is a study with uh, very low birth weight children at the age of five to eight years old. Um, and again, we look at to, into risk factors at birth. We looked into the temperament and hyperactive behavior. Uh, children's personality factors we took into account, and of course we took the Emily strategies of the mother, and and we found this is we found more or less um, that all factors from all factors the Emily strategies are the strongest one to explain the cognitive modifiability of the child, who is a typically developing child at the age of 
five to eight, but he was born with very low birth weight. This is a study on, this is the same study, and you can see that the question was, when we look on ma mother's mediation, to whom they mediate more? To typically developing children, normally born children, or very low birth weight children? And you, have, you can have rival hypotheses to both. And what we found is, mothers are mediating more to children who were born with very low birth weight. This is at the age of five to eight. They for, I mean, it's many years passed away already. But still, the, they feel, the mother feels that the child has some difficulties and they compensate for the level of difficulty of the child by giving more mediation. Again, we don't tell the mothers what, what they are supposed to do. We just tell them, can you play with this game or something like that? And we have videotaped this play with the children and then we analyze the the exact, it's like very high resolution analysis of what the mothers are doing with the children based on the five criteria of mediation. Each of them is broken down to manageable units, operationalized to manageable units of behavior. Um, this is a study on sibling mediation of Children, ah, now I see, <laughs> of children who are mediating to their intellectually, uh, this, uh, intellectually disabled child, or they used to say mentally retarded brother or sister. And so we didn't tell them what to do. We just told them, can you mediate? And what we found is that children, who, me, uh, siblings mediate to their young, young sibling. Uh, if the young sibling is intellectually disabled, you can see the ID group is the green one. They mediate much higher, on much higher level than typically developing children. We have here two groups of typically developing children. One of with mental age equivalent to the ID group. I mean, the gap between the older and the youngest. And one with chronological gap. Chronological gap between the youngest and the, and the oldest. Because age also plays a role here. So no matter what, the ID group was mediating much more than the typically developing. Now, I used many studies on intervention programs I use the instrumental enrichment, the Bright Start program for young children, peer mediation with young children, cognitive modifiability battery, Syria Think program, uh, analogical reasoning program. I developed all kinds of programs, intervention programs, educational programs for young children. And the aim of the intervention was to teach mainly learning how to learn. So the assessment by by, uh, I mean, it makes sense to assess, to assess also the, in dynamic assessment, because in dynamic assessment we are looking how the child learns, not so much what is the uh, standardized uh, functioning. So, this is a study on instrumental enrichment showing that the children who showed low modifiability in the beginning of the study, uh, but if they were in the experimental group, as you can see the first, the first one, low, they showed the highest cognitive modifiability at the end of the program. Whereas the control group, they were low in the beginning and they continue to be low. Those in the medium continue to be medium. Those in the that were high continue to be high. So nothing changed. Those who were low continue to be no medium, medium, high, high. But with the experimental group, it changed the whole situation. Uh, we did a study on Bright Start program. 
it's very, I will not go into it because of time limits, but I will tell you what I interpret from that. If, are you familiar with the snowball effect? Snowball effect means if you are implanting um, a kernel of change within the individual, the tendency will be that this kernel of change will be like a snowball. It will grow up and grow up even more and more and more. It's like a nuclear reaction. You don't have to refuel it each time. It just grows by itself because you already implanted. So here what we found that the experimental group in a follow-up situation, I look on the follow-up, they changed higher than the control group when we gave them a dynamic test. Both of them were taught how to solve these problems of the CATM, but the experimental children benefited more from the teaching and improved themselves more than the others. I have peer mediation uh, programs where experimental children benefited more from mediation. As you can see, higher level of the, the blue line is experimental children. Um, these are the learners also improved more than the learners in the control group. This is a peer mediation. We taught peer, young children the theory of mediation. It, was, it is a program of, of 10 hours, like eight sessions, 10 hours, and they become wonderful mediators. Young children become wonderful mediators. If I had more time, I could bring here a tape and show you how young children are mediating one to another. It's beautiful to see that. Um, I'm skipping that because of time problems. Um, and again, we see again and again in many studies that experimental children benefiting from the peers' mediation and showing high level of cognitive modifiability in tests that are not related to the program that they got. They got totally different tests. Dynamic test, not related. The activity was not, was not uh, cognitive. The activity was teaching them how to mediate. But we didn't teach them any, anything that is like a test or some problem to solve or anything. But they just used it better in a different context where they are taught they know how to, to benefit from the, from the teaching given to them and to improve themselves better. So, uh, I'm skipping those and we'll come to, a, this is the last uh, study that we, I will present to you, intervention to close gender gaps in mental rotation. Mental rotation is considered to be gender related. No matter what, all the studies show, girls are doing worse than boys. Why? We don't know exactly. Maybe they are born like that. As a matter of fact, there are studies at the age of three weeks. Three weeks. And they show that boys are better, uh, have better mental rotation than girls. Now you ask yourself, how can you, how can you test three weeks old infants on mental rotation? What do you do? Okay, you're familiar with the habituation studies? Habituation studies, you show to um, a child a picture above and the uh, camera is picking the eye movements. And in the old studies, maybe of the 50s or 60s, they show the habituation of the eye. Like if you look at something very, very um, uh, new, novel, novel information, there is a tendency to, for the alertness to go down and down and down, eye movements are going down and down, the child is not interested anymore. So they use this technique with infants. So they put a figure, so boys and girls were looking at the figure, this was very interesting, and then this was started the level, a uh, habituation process. Then what they did, they rotated the picture. And there were levels of rotation and so on, they did all kinds of manipulations. And what happened? The girls 
when it is rotated, they look at it and they say, it's a picture. So the habituation process continued. But the boys, they said, oh, this is new. Yes, it's rotated. So they immediately identified that this is a different thing. This is the technique that they used. So it, it, they just wanted to prove that it starts from a very, very early age. And there are studies that show developmentally that the higher the age, the higher the gaps between boys and girls. So we wanted to, and so they say that this is an, anatomic. This is anatomic. So we did a study. We wanted to show that it is possible to change this anatomically things. Okay, here's one of the tests, holistic rotation of object. Now, by the way, mental rotation is not just a little thing that, who cares, so I don't have a mental rotation, so what? It affects, there's researchers who say it affects almost all spheres of life. It explains why the number of women in architecture, in physics, and engineering is so low as the number of, of uh, males in, in the academics, and so on and so on. Because those professions require a lot of mental rotation. This is a, a, a skill that is required in, in those kinds of professions. So, we developed a test of mental rotation, so the child has to find, uh, to mark the black after being rotated 45 degrees, and this is for grade one, you see, the child has to mark them, and then to mark, and then to mark. This is level one, we have level two, and we have level three. In level three, it's more difficult because there is no black, there is no red roof, and, and you have only half of the, oh, half of the, the squares are, and it's, it's, not, it's not easy. So, this, is, this was developed, uh, was published uh, uh, three years ago in child development. You can see that in the experimental group, the girls, you can see in the experimental group, the girls in red, they close the gap. Whereas in the control group, nothing happened. I mean, after, after, inter after mediation, they did not receive the program. They just received... A, a pre and post test, a dynamic test of, with pre and post. So nothing, no, this is not dynamic. Pre and post is before and after the intervention, sorry. Before and after the intervention. So there were three months passed in between. So everyone improved, the boys and the girls improved a little bit. But, the, but in the experimental group, first of all, they were much higher. And second, the girls close the gap. It's not significant anymore. So it's possible to change mental rotation of girls. I think this is one of the first studies that shows it. Until now, they gave intervention to boys and girls. But then what they found, that both of them improved. In the same, I mean, they both of them improved. And the boys were higher than girls after improvement. Nothing changed. No closing of the gap. The reason we, are, we were successful is that I think so. What is mental rotation? What does it require? Mental rotation requires looking at the percept from a holistic point of view. You look at the percept and then you see the whole thing change. Girls have a tendency to look the, for the details. The corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, so that it's too much to process. But, but you can learn how to process it in a holistic way. So this is what we did. We taught them how to do it in a... So they, okay, once you teach them, they, they, they do it. It's, it's easy to do it. Um, so, and this is the last slide. The literature is replete with evidence showing a strong relation between IQ and school achievement. This is, a matter of fact, a, 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 a sentence given by two guys, uh, Frisbee and Braden, 1992. I, w I had a duel with them 
a literature duel on dynamic assessment. And I say, but we have, they, they, they uh, brought a, a, a meta-analytic study, study based on more than 2,500 studies with IQ and uh, academic achievement. It's huge. And they did, in the meta-analysis, they found that the correlation between IQ and school achievement is 0.71, which is pretty good. So why do we need dynamic assessment if we can give psychometric tests? It predicts school achievement. Why do we need dynamic assessment? This means that nearly 50% of the variance in learning outcomes for students can be explained by differences in psychometric IQ. So in order to answer them, I answer with a question. Loyal to my mediating approach, which requires knowing how to ask the question. A good, answer, a good question is half the answer. However, three extremely important questions remain. What causes the other 50% of achievement variance? And I'm going from the light to the more severe. What causes the other 50%? And the second question. What I, when IQ predicts low achievement, what is necessary to defeat that prediction? Do we just sit there and accept it? Or we want to defeat it? And the third one, what factors influencing the unexplained variance can help to defeat the prediction in the explained variance? For those of you who are not very much familiar with all the statistics, I will say it in, in a friendly way. Um, if, for example, intrinsic motivation, emotional intelligence, resiliency, are factors that affect achievements as well. We know that school achievement is not just a result of IQ. There are other factors as well that are also are responsible. What can we, can we take these factors and manipulate them and in that way we are going to defeat that, that relationship between IQ and achievements. I don't say that IQ do not, has nothing to do. I don't say that, but at least lower it and give more role to other factors such as type of mediation, which is somehow related to non-intellective factors, and holistically, we have to look at things in a holistic way, and this will explain the academic achievements of children. Thank you very much.